It can't rain all the time. Except for viewers in Scotland. So, as most of you will have seen by now, after knocking on for 20 years of false starts and development hell, a new movie of The Crow is almost upon us. A few weeks ago, we got a first look photo of Bill Pennywise Skarsgård in full Eric Draven rig. And about a week ago, we got a trailer. The response to all of which has been, let's say, mixed. In particular, the reaction of diehard fans of the original movie and the original comic book uh, vary from trepidatious to just plain horrified. Really, I have never known a film to generate such ill will by its mere existence. People really don't want this movie to happen. That's the thing about The Crow. It's a film that people really seem to take to their hearts. It's a movie which people feel they have a kind of a personal relationship with. So the objections to the new movie began as soon as we saw that photo, with a lot of people pointing out that this new Eric Draven resembles nobody quite so much as Jared Leto's Joker from Suicide Squad, with many people wondering aloud why on earth you would seek to evoke memories of possibly the least fondly remembered thing from the last 10 years of pop culture. But also pointing out that this movie just kind of doesn't look and feel like The Crow. The Crow and initially at first its sequels, are all set in this kind of goth rock fantasy world. In the first movie, the city's meant to be Detroit, but it's very much this dark fantasy Detroit created using backlots and miniatures. It's like a smaller, shabbier version of the Gotham City that Anton first created for Tim Burton's movie, but where Tim Burton's Gotham City is a kind of gothic citadel. The Crow's Detroit is a kind of gothic shithole. This movie just looks like it was shot in regular cities, and apparently it was mainly filmed in Prague. But the main objection a lot of people seem to be having is, why, even if you want to do another Crow movie, why does it have to be a remake slash reboot of the original? Couldn't you just make another Tale of the Crow? Because the only thing denoting this as a remake slash reboot rather than just another Crow movie is the fact that the protagonist and his murdered girlfriend are called Eric and Shelley again. Like they were in the 94 movie and indeed like they were in the comic book. Now apparently the director of this film, Rupert Sanders, has gone on the record as saying, aha, this is not a remake of the 1994 movie, it is another adaptation of James O'Barr's original comic book, We Are Going Back to the Source. Is it though? Really? I've read the comic book and this trailer looks nothing like the comic book. I don't recognise any elements in this trailer from the comic book other than Eric Shelley brought back from the dead by a crow. Whereas the 1994 movie actually sticks pretty close to the comic book. There are a couple of scenes in which they've patently used the comic book as a storyboard. So whether or not this film is a remake of the 94 movie or a reboot of the whole franchise going back to the comic book, the only thing really denoting it as such is the fact that the protagonists are called Eric and Shelley. By the simple expedient of calling them, I don't know, Derek and Kelly, we could have avoided all of this. But let's face it, the real answer is probably that. The makers of this new movie don't want this to be associated with the previous franchise because for all that the first movie is one of a lot of people's favourite movies and is this beloved classic, the sequels are not fondly remembered and for good reason. Generally, the consensus is they start badly, get worse, and end atrociously. They actually started quite promisingly with the first one, Crow City of Angels, back in 1996, because they had had this, at the time, I thought, quite clever idea of getting around the fact that Brandon Lee, the star of the original movie, was not available for any sequels, of which more in due course. At some stage, they had the idea that, hey, rather than just recasting Brandon's character Eric Draven with somebody who looks a bit like Brandon Lee, with, I should point out, the exception of the short-lived TV show from 1998 in which Eric Draven was indeed recast as Mark Dacascos, who looks a bit like Brandon Lee. How about the thing that happens to Eric in the first movie is just a thing that happens from time to time. That sometimes somebody meets such a gruesome and unjust death that their unquiet spirit is resurrected by a mysterious crow and set loose to vrik their ruengi. And so the sequels are, rather than being about the further undead adventures of Eric, 
about other people that the crow thing happens to. So in that first one, you have Vincent Perez playing a character called Ash. And apparently this first sequel, when it was originally written by David Goya, and apparently some way into the filming process, being directed by Tim Pope, the Cure Videos guy, because if you want your movie to look like a Cure video, get the guy who makes all the Cure videos. Apparently this did actually go off in some quite interesting directions, at least initially. But during the editing phase, the producers, including, remember, that Prince Among Men, Harvey Weinstein, decided that what they really wanted was a rehash of the original, and so it was hacked up into an inferior rehash of the original. Now, the second sequel, The Crow Salvation, is, to my mind, actually kind of underrated, and rather unfairly underrated. It got no kind of release, no theatrical release at all, barely even got a DVD release, and it is currently, as far as I know, the only one of The Crow movies that isn't streaming on any platform anywhere. But it actually works quite well as a movie on its own terms. And there's a bit of a twist on the premise. In this movie, rather than the protagonist being murdered, he is stitched up for the murder of his girlfriend and wrongly executed. So when the crow resurrects him, it's not simply the old vengeance trail again. He's actually trying to solve the mystery of who killed his girlfriend and framed him. And in another nice little innovation, those the crow markings that all our protagonists now seem to have. While in the first movie, the heroes had definitely painted those markings on. In the third movie, they are scars left on his face from his botched execution in the electric chair. What lets it down is that it kind of looks cheap. And it's also the first of the Crow movies not to be set in some kind of goth rock fantasy world, but just shot in some fairly boring locations. And the fourth and heretofore final Crow movie, Wicked Prayer, is a total hot mess from start to finish and doesn't really warrant much discussion here. But the sequels have all got the same problem. And it's a problem that however good this new movie is or isn't, it will inevitably have as well, which is that none of them can ever hope to match the emotional weight of the first movie, because in all the Crow movies other than that first one starring Brandon Lee, the leading man isn't dead. You see, movies like this are essentially action tragedies, and they depend for all their impact on the emotional weight of the story. Now, even today, 30 years after its release, on an emotional level, watching that original 1994 movie is basically a 90-minute gut punch. You are, for its entire length, essentially being beaten about the face and neck with layer upon layer of tragedy and irony. The tragedy, of course, being how good Brandon Lee is in that film and what an amazing career he didn't have. Looking at that movie, if you didn't know that he was already dead by the time filming concluded, you would just have assumed that this young guy was going to go on to be one of the great leading men of his generation. He's crazy good looking. He's brilliant in the action sequences, but he's funny and quirky and charming and charismatic. And he was already gone by the time the movie came out. But moreover, it's the irony of which film this happened on. So yeah, while it was kind of gutting in 2008 to watch Heath Ledger as the Joker in The Dark Knight and think, wow, he was going to be so great and he's already gone. Unlike Brandon Lee and The Crow, Heath Ledger doesn't spend the entire length of that movie lamenting his own death. Because this is a film in which, of course, Brandon Lee's character gets murdered right at the beginning, is resurrected, and then spends the rest of the movie in a state of existential despair about the fact that he's dead. And you're watching this and you're thinking, yeah, Brandon, I bet it does suck. There's also the, the technical irony of the fact that the day they accidentally shot and killed him was the very last time he was going to be shot on the set of this movie. Because, of course, Brandon, playing as he is an undead, avenging zombie, gets shot something like 200 times over the course of that film. He spent a substantial part of the shoot covered in squibs and blood bags. And on the final day, somebody fires a gun at him, it happens to be improperly loaded, and it kills him. I'm not going to go into the details of what they actually did. Suffice it to say, it was a sequence of minor but preventable mistakes leading to a massive tragedy. So that's the thing. That's the uncomfortable truth about The Crow. 
part of the reason that movie works as well as it did is it acquired, by tragic accident, a whole layer of emotional resonance which none of the sequels could ever reproduce and which no film should ever try to reproduce. So that's why, however good or bad they were and however good or bad they were ever going to be, the sequels were never going to work. You're watching City of Angels and actually a lot of it is pretty good, but at the end of the day, you don't care because Vincent Perez isn't dead. The Crow Salvation has some pretty neat ideas in it, but at the end of the day, you don't care because Eric Mabius isn't dead. And The Crow Wicked Prayer is a total shambles from start to finish, and you don't care because even by his own standards, Edward Furlong wasn't even slightly dead. I found myself wondering, actually, how well would the first movie have worked had it not been for that tragic circumstance? The only thing you could possibly do would be to take somebody who has no idea what happened to Brandon Lee and plonk him down in front of that movie, show them the whole thing, and then go, what do you think? But even that would be cruel, because you'd then have to tell them what happened to Brandon Lee, and that would break their heart. So that, folks, is the uncomfortable truth about The Crow. No new Crow movie, be it sequel, reboot, remake, is ever going to hit as hard as that first one. You're never going to reproduce the impact of that first movie. And nor should you try. Thanks for watching. If you liked it, please hit like and share. If you'd like to see more, please hit subscribe. And if you'd like to help me make more, please visit patreon.com slash mitchben.